Good morning. Come on in, find a seat. We're here for a reason this morning. And I think Psalm 95 expresses some of that very well, some of the reasons we're here today. So I just wanted to read the first seven verses to start off our service. Psalm 95 says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. O God, thank you for being our God, that we can call you our father this morning. That we've come into this place to, to sing to you, to praise you. To just declare what a great and awesome God you are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, thank you for being here in our midst this morning. May you be honored in everything we do. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know that there's any real specific announcements that need to be made today. Just hope you got a bulletin as you came in, as you came in and take note of things that are happening this week. There's different Christmas things happening and various things starting. Um, also, I want to encourage you, if you're new with us today, if you wanted to fill out one of the little uh, guest cards, information cards in the pew, and put that in the offering, we'd like to stay in touch with you if, if we can. I'm going to do something a little different this morning. I guess I tend to do that once in a while. Um, I want to do this carefully because I want to honor some of you in a way that brings glory to God. And I'm not going to embarrass you, hopefully, um, but I've had the wonderful privilege of working in recent months with a, a terrific group of volunteers and kind of a tedious task of updating and revising our chapel guidelines. But it's been a wonderful team to work with. And at the end of our last meeting, we started talking about what makes Bridgeport Chapel work. And it's you and the God that's in you. That God has created each one of us uniquely for a purpose, and we each have a place to play in his work. So this morning... Um, I'm going to read a list just to say thank you. Nobody's name's on this list, but I just want to thank you for participating and volunteering in the work of Christ. So if I read something that you do in the body of Christ, I'd just like you to stand up. I know that's a little embarrassing, kind of, but at the end, I want to be very careful that we give all the glory to God because it's him working in you. But I thank God for you um, because every part of the body of Christ is valued. So if, you, if you're involved in any of these following ministries, please stand up. If you greet people at the door on Sunday morning, if you're a Sunday school teacher, just stand up if I call something you do or you help in a Sunday school class. If you work in the sound room or the church library, maybe you help with some of these decorations that we see on Sunday morning. Maybe you help with music in some way or you help keep the grounds or the, the buildings looking nice. Maybe you work with the youth group. Perhaps you serve on a ministry team 
like the trustees or the fellowship team or the women's team, the CE team, the missions team, or the elders. Maybe you lead a game night or a craft day. Maybe you packed a shoebox for Operation Christmas Child. Maybe you helped organize a special event or a class. Maybe you're a chapel officer. Maybe you lead worship. Perhaps you set up tables or chairs for special events or clean up afterwards. Or you do something I just didn't think of because it's unseen and only God knows. Please stand up. I want to thank you all. And just before I have you sit down, I just want to pray God's blessing on you and also give him thanks for the body of Christ. So, Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ, for what they do to serve you. God, I pray that you would instill in our hearts what a great privilege it is to be a servant of God. But God, above all, I know that it's you in us that gives us that heart to serve. So God, th thank you that long ago you saw each one of us and you created us uniquely for a purpose, for a place in the body of Christ. And so, Father, I just bless you and thank you for what you've done in and through us for your glory. May it continue, Father. And, Father, if there are some that just feel like this morning, I'm not sure what my place is yet. Father, I pray you'd be working in their hearts and give them a passion, a desire of how they can be a part of your work in this world. So thank you, my God for your goodness to us in so many ways. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Wow. Ah. Okay, we're going to review a couple verses real quick. We're going to go back and look at Romans, and if it's up there, that's great. If it's not, we'll see how we're doing. The significant... It's usually just the first word that's different in some translations. I think the one we're doing says because, right? Okay, let's try. Ah, there we go. Let's give it a try. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth he confesses and is saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Okay, only messed up a few words, but get it in your heart. We want to introduce John 1, 12. It's a fairly familiar verse, but I really like this. Because the, right before it, it talks about he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But then he says, but... The contrast, and then there's John 1, 12. Let's try. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John 1, 12. Okay, thank you. Okay. I just want to take a couple minutes to pray. There's a number of requests in our, um, in our bulletin. Um, I just want to lift, lift some of these up to, up to God this morning. And is there just something really pressing on someone's heart you would like us to pray with you about this morning? I don't want to take a long time for this, but is there something that's just you'd really like to, the body of Christ to come around you and pray about this morning? Well, let's, let's go to God in prayer. Oh, Father, I thank you. I just thank you for walking with us through every step of the journey. You're such a faithful God. And Lord, we want to we pray for the, for the 
King family, for Allison, and, and Lord, for the unexpected um, occurrence on Thanksgiving. And oh, oh God, I just pray for your comfort, for your presence to be known, for your kindness to just be felt in a very real way in that family. Guide their steps, help them through the, the journey of untangling the details now in the aftermath. And I just wanna thank you, God, for being there for them today. Lord, there's several in our bulletin that are walking through uh, just some challenging physical issues. Father, I'm not gonna read every name right now, but I thank you for where you're bringing healing Thank you, God, for your faithfulness in the journey as many continue different kinds of treatments or different things. I think of the little precious little baby that was born very prematurely. And Lord, that we've been praying for, God, I pray you continue to just bring strength and health and growth. And Lord, sustain this little life. And Lord Jesus, I want to not forget our brother Nathan over there in Kenya. Yeah. Father, I thank you for his heart just to follow you and to boldly go out and serve you on the other side of the world, Father. But I just want to pray your blessing, protection, your goodness, your direction upon him this morning. And Lord, I thank you for your, your care for each and every one of us. Lord, every one of us is on a journey. If we stop and talk to anybody this morning, um, we, each are, we each are walking through sometimes very challenging things that perhaps nobody knows. But Lord Jesus, I just wanna pray that you continue to guide us and sustain us as well as we follow you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you are able, please stand with us and join us in worshiping.
Amen. 
This time I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward, if we will. We can worship God in our giving. Oh, Father. Father God, you loved us so much that you gave your son. God, you didn't want us to perish. You wanted us to have eternal life with you. And Father God, I just thank you that your spirit in us now moves us, God, to give back to you our whole life. And God, we've brought some gifts and offerings to offer to you as well today. That we want your work to go forward. We want the name of Jesus to be lifted up here and around the world. So Father, use these gifts to build your church, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, if you would stand with me in honor of God's word as we read from Habakkuk this morning. I'm not sure if I'm going to wait till we all find it. <laughs> it's back there in the Old, Old Testament, Minor Prophets. But Habakkuk chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 10 and read down through the end of the chapter. The mountains saw you and wreathed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came with a whir like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses and the surging of mighty waters. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Amen. May God bless his word. You may be seated as Jonathan comes forward to teach us this morning. Good morning, everybody. I was just sitting there thinking, I wonder how many of you have your Christmas tree up already. I see a few hands. Thank you, Steve. Tis the season. Well, I hope you're able to find Habakkuk. If you haven't, go ahead and find him. Take your time. He's there. It does help if you, especially in this kind of flyover, if you're able to follow there in, in your own scripture, you can see where we're at. We skip things. We hit things. And um, <clears throat> if you were here last week, we finished the book of Jeremiah and then his writings called Lamentations and uh, Jeremiah's ministry started well before the three invasions of Babylon. We looked at those briefly and he and his life ended after those three invasions so quite a, quite a long uh, ministry we saw that not only did he prophesy then but he he lived through some of that prophecy and some of that fulfillment. He saw some of that come about, um, witnessing it, viewing it, and feeling it in his case. At some point, um, Jeremiah, after the de destruction of Jerusalem, the third and final wave of Babylon, he wrote Lamentations, or sometimes been called the Wailings. And this is because he's mourning the destruction he, you might picture him sitting on the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley looking at the destroyed city. The temple, the city walls, most of the houses, ruin was the lot. So Jeremiah mourns and weeps over the destruction, not only of the city, right, of the possessions and the land, but of the people and their loss of relationship with God, their loss of what they could have had. And we talked about, we reminded ourselves that just as Judah experienced the Lord's discipline at that time, we too experienced the Lord's discipline in our lives. Why? Because we're the ones that he loves. It says he disciplines those he loves. Well, we have to back up a little bit today. Jeremiah gave us a broader, more long-term view of that kind of end of Judah's era there, but there's a couple prophets who began their ministry after Jeremiah 
That's why we're covering them now. But they spoke mostly from a pre-invasion perspective, a pre-Babylon time frame. So Jeremiah took us all the way through Judah's demise, but let's back up today and we're going to be, as you know, in the prophet Habakkuk. So you can see a date of 609 for Habakkuk. That's, that's close, somewhere pre-Babylon. Um, if you want, you can, I, I mentioned it before, but I, I have a Bible. I wrote the dates right there at the, at the heading of each of those minor prophet books. That kind of helps you if you come back to those minor prophets in the future. You'll say, oh, this is about when that took place, if you feel like you want to do that. As the prophets then continue to urge the nation to turn to God, remember this is right before Babylon now, turn from evil, God's patience, his long suffering is evident, isn't it? He gives more mercy and more time than probably all of our collective mercy and time put together in this room. So these prophets now, Habakkuk, he's an ambassador for God's truth. And we remember that there was a wicked king named Manasseh on the throne in, in Judah. He reigned 55 years and he really dumped Judah into a bad position. And that's where they are. Habakkuk and then Ezekiel will be next. And they play an important role in this time period that, again, is just prior to God's discipline being played out on Judah. Habakkuk views the state of the culture his culture, his people, and he has a conversation with God. You can see there is the basic three parts to this book. It's a short book, and you, you have a, a first dialogue and a second dialogue, and then what I just call praise and prayer from Habakkuk. So let's look at the first dialogue. That starts in chapter 1, verse 1. And you, you see here, you can scan it, Habakkuk seems deeply concerned about the holiness of God. It was not represented well, perhaps hardly at all, in his land. And the prophet wonders then why God has not taken action in order to correct this in their midst. Look at verses 2 and 3. How long, Lord, must I call for help and, and you do not listen or cry out to you about violence and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. Now this is Judah he's referring to. How can God let this go on? Why don't you do something, God? We need godly leaders. Maybe you can relate to these questions. Have you ever wondered something similar? Perhaps it's in our culture at large. Our country, you might say, is trending in the direction of Judah. Perhaps it's just more personal, more injustice. There's cruelty in some sense toward you or your family. Why don't you step in, God, and deal with this? Well, Habakkuk is a righteous, loving man. He has inquired of God, and now in verses 2, or in, in verses two and 4 is his inquiry. And then God responds in verses 5 through 11. And that takes us through the first dialogue. Though God may be silent when wickedness reigns, this should not be interpreted to mean that he is unaware, that he does not care, or that he is without recourse. So as Habakkuk is about to discover, God has a plan to intervene. Look at verse 6. Look, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Now, undoubtedly, Habakkuk knew about the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. At this point, they were feared in the world with their pursuit of world conquest. They were trampling nation after nation. They were feared. They were also wicked. You see there in verse 11 a description of the effectiveness of Babylon's military and violence. We're in chapter 1. God speaking here. It's a description of the rod of God's discipline. They were on the move. They were active even now. Now, that brings us to the second dialogue, beginning in verse 12 of chapter 1 still, and that goes all the way through the last part of chapter 2, verse 20 of chapter 2. So Habakkuk responds to God. No longer can he accuse God of being inactive or inattentive, but now it seems that he is confused, even upset, about God's choice in dealing with them of bringing the wicked Babylon, Babylonians to discipline. 
He addresses God, I think it's carefully and with honor in verse 12. He is holy, eternal, without end, the righteous judge. He even says he is my rock. He holds fast to God, I think, but he is struggling. If God is holy, his eyes are too pure to look on evil and he can't tolerate wrongdoing. Why? Why Babylon? Why tolerate their evil that they're carrying out and the evil that they will carry out upon us here shortly? In verse 13, there's a a parallel illustration used. Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? It seems that God has designed for a, a wicked man to treat one less wicked with brutality. Habakkuk is struggling. Maybe you can relate to that struggle. Babylon's further described in verses 15 and 16. Their power is absolute. It's like an indiscriminate fisherman pulling anything and everything out of the sea, dominating all creatures, and they don't even see or know that they are God's tool. They do all this for their own evil pleasure and increase of power, They grow rich, they grow powerful by their own strength and at the expense of nations and peoples. They do not worship God. They do not love justice. So Habakkuk has some real questions, some real complaints, if you will. I think we've all felt something similar in some sense in our life, though probably not this obvious in-your-face way that Habakkuk's looking at now. He's looking at this huge, overpowering juggernaut of a nation. There's no way to force justice or peace with them. And, And the wild thing is, it seems like God is behind it. Look at verse two, or verse one of chapter two. Habakkuk wants God to explain himself further. He's still not quite satisfied, if you will. He pictures himself there in verse 1, chapter 2, stationed at the lookout tower, the guard post. Now, if he were there physically, he would be the first one to notice the, an approaching party. The, the idea is he's waiting and anticipating God's response. He says, I will watch and see what he will say to me. So we're in that second dialogue, and now God takes his turn and responds. So it's, uh, God's response is, is verse 2 through 20. And it's an assurance from God to the concerned prophet here that divine justice will prevail in the end. This is an important message. God said to write it down. Verse 2, it's meant for ears in addition to Habakkuk. Maybe it's meant for our ears. In verse 3, God promises that what he is about to say will indeed happen. Now check this out. It hasn't happened yet, but this assurance that is this is assurance that it will happen. And after it does happen, this testifies to God's faithfulness. And it incriminates those who didn't believe. There was a whole bunch of them. The message through the prophet. Verse 4 has some interpretive difficulties there, but I think the basics of it communicates that God is not targeting the innocent or the upright in his judgment. You see there that it says the righteous will live by their integrity or faithfulness to God. That phrase, the righteous one will live by his faith or the translation that you might have, that's quoted three times in the New Testament from the prophet. Habakkuk, the faithfulness of the righteous one as they are committed to God, that will be their salvation. So God is not overlooking the innocent or the righteous in the sweeping judgment that's about to take place. By verse 5, then, the focus is clearly on the Babylonians, on their condemnation. The rest of the Lord's speech here has five what you might call woe oracles. We've looked at some oracles before. Some of them were woe oracles. These woes were in the form of a cry that one might hear at a funeral. So Babylon's funeral is nigh. Verse 6 is the first one. Woe to him who amasses what is not his, but how much longer? Eventually the creditors will arise and demand payment from Babylon. 
The second is in verse 9, chapter 2 here. Woe to him who dishonestly makes wealth for his house. It's targeted toward Babylon. Chapter 2, verse 12. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with injustice. Verse 15. Woe to him who gives his neighbors drink, pouring out your wrath, and then even makes them drink in order to look at their nakedness. But the time is coming when you, Babylon, will be exposed and filled with disgrace. And then the final woe in verse 19. Woe to him who says to wood, wake up or to mute stone, come alive. There's no breath. No life, no power in your idols, Babylon. And then verse 14, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the water covers the sea. So ultimately, He will be the everlasting power, not Babylon. So God has given a valuable glimpse here to Habakkuk and to us that He is in control and that Babylon, the powerful and seemingly unstoppable evil, is under his sovereignty, if you can accept that. God's not overlooking anything then or now. He's not up there wringing his hands, wondering what he should do next. He's in control, and I might say it's predetermined. Now, what if you happen to disagree with God? Why does he deal with evil as he does or does not deal with evil? I mean, why do children get caught up in all this? Why do the righteous get caught up in this? Why don't the wicked get what they deserve sooner? The questions can go on. There's a a lot going on in those questions. We don't have anywhere near enough time to, to address it all. But it's okay to ask those questions as Habakkuk does. And then the key is it's right to look for answers in the character of God. Now, I'm not sure that we'll fully understand this side of heaven, but we will understand more and more as we understand God himself more and more. At the basis of all of this, it's not an argument with God. It's not a questioning of his character and his motives. It must not be in faith. Look at verse 20. It says, be silent in his presence. Rather, with faith, we pursue him. That brings us to chapter 3, praise and prayer. The dialogue is over now, and Habakkuk takes up his pen. Verse 2, chapter 3, he stands in awe and fear now and asks God to make his work known while remembering mercy. God, please remember mercy. And it seems to me that Chapter 3, verse 3, and then all the way through 15 is, is kind of a poem of praise, a glorious revealing of God from the prophet's mind. Verse 3, God is pictured as coming from the south and arrives on the scene with brilliance and flashing rays, eliciting praise from the whole earth. The picture here, it seems to be that of a warrior bent on a mission, rivers, mountains, sea, The sun and the moon, they're all brought into the equation as God marches across the earth, trampling the nations in wrath. This is his just wrath. The mighty warrior, the true sovereign, will make a quick end to Babylon and will avenge his people. Now, the language here, Habakkuk's writing, it's a little removed for us, isn't it? Babylon's not right on our heels, breathing down our necks, but... This picture of divine wrath has produced fear in Habakkuk. So I I hope you're able to get into the prophet's shoes for just a minute. Feel as he feels. He describes his fear. But he also declares assurance and confidence in the last few verses of the writing that Steve read there. He's able to face evil in his own people and his own culture. And he declares, look at verse 16, the last part of verse 16 that he must wait quietly for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. That's his current position. Then you see in 17 and 18 that the prophet is able to rest in trust, even though he's looking at pain that is going to be caused by, to put it mildly, a less than loving source. Now it may be removed from us in some ways, but in others it's not. We live in a time, as 
really, I think you could say most times in history, where we may not agree with or we struggle with things going on in the world, right? Maybe it's our own government, our own culture. Some of these simply do not line up with God's ways. They're not biblical. They're not founded on truth. They're, now, as Christians as in our culture, there's appropriate practices for us to take part in, right? You can speak out in certain ways and stand up in certain ways. You can vote against ungodly ideas and practices. And I hope you are. This is being a good ambassador for Christ in the culture, in the broken world. You're doing those things. But nonetheless, even as we do those things, as we look for ways to be active, it can cause pain. It does cause pain. Now, there's other parts of life, circumstances of so many sorts that cause pain. Circumstances. Maybe the hardest one is we feel pain caused by individuals. Could be removed relationship, somebody out there. Perhaps, though, it's a family member. Or perhaps it's a close, trusted friend, someone you've committed to, but they've used you, they've hurt you, they've caused you pain. We all face pain. Now, how do we deal with that pain is the question I want to ask, especially when caused by a less-than-loving source. Babylon, as a wicked nation, was about to cause a lot of pain to Habakkuk personally. It says that some of this took place during his time. And to Judah as a nation. Now, this is a complicated subject, right? God cannot be blamed for evil in the world or evil that's against me, against you. But somehow, in his faithfulness and his sovereignty, and we touched on this last week, but we're going to touch on it again he uses even evil for our good. Remember God's discipline. Sometimes that comes from a less than loving source. It's to teach us, to bring us to maturity, to help us in trusting and turning to him. Sometimes we might be caught up in the circumstances, such as those who were righteous, who were godly in Judah. But it's still within the plan of God. Even the most cruel situations can have value. I think Habakkuk helps us here with a simple formula in dealing with pain in our lives caused by less than loving sources. So think for a minute. Maybe you already have something in your mind. Is there something that has or that is causing you pain from a less than loving source? And then what's the formula? How do we get through this? How do we deal with this pain? Jeffrey T. Bull was not the traditional missionary of the 20th century. Jeffrey was born into a Christian family in Eltham, England, 1921. He came to know Christ as his personal savior at an early age and was involved in the Brethren Church with his family. By the time he was 20 years old, he was intent on being a missionary to Central Asia. His church stood with him, but Jeffrey had to wait until the end of the Second World War before taking the first steps toward Asia. In 1947, Jeffrey, together with a fellow missionary, George Patterson, sailed for China. They traveled to the far interior of China to the border area shared with Tibet where they first studied the Chinese language. After three years of intensive language study, they were able to get a working knowledge of that tongue and also the Tibetan language. They then began to move into the borderland of Tibet and make some good contacts with the tribal leaders whose realm of influence, influence reached well into Tibet. Jeffrey Bull first set foot on the Tibetan soil on July 29, 1950. He wrote in his Bible, Just before noon, I crossed the river of the golden sand, which flows from the upper reaches of the Yangtze, and set my foot down on Tibetan soil. For me, a very great event. They were learning the culture and the religion of these people to whom they wanted to reach with the gospel. They lived among them in their nomadic lifestyles. They learned to ride their high-spirited ponies and they ate their food. 
It was at this time that the Chinese communist forces took control of Tibet. Jeffrey had entered during the last days of Tibetan independence. He was arrested by the Chinese and accused of being a spy for Britain. Thus began over three years of captivity. For the first 12 months, Jeffrey was kept in solitary confinement in a very small cell where he had hardly enough room to turn around. Later, he was confined to a Chinese prison where he underwent the subtle mental torture of re-education and thought reform through a steady, steady diet of communist propaganda. He was told that if he did not cooperate, his family back in England would suffer severe consequences. Jeffrey Bull demonstrated real faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through unimaginably difficult circumstances. He likened, actually, later his persecution to the experience of Jesus, who from the realms of glory as master of the universe was, through his incarnation, confined to the limitations of a human body, just like Jeffrey was confined to a tiny Chinese cell. Jeffrey faced pain caused by a less than loving source. Now, how did he deal with that pain? I don't know if he knew any verses from Habakkuk or not. He did testify that part of how he dealt with it was, was um, a daily routine that he developed, included praying, singing hymns, and reciting memorized Bible verses. I don't think he had a Bible. If we don't know the right formula, if we don't know, have the right focus, when pain faces us, it becomes easy to deal with it by natural methods of the flesh. We know how these go, don't we? Anger, we get bitter, we might take revenge, it's natural for us to worry, even be apathetic or consumed with urgency about everything going on. And you can add to that list, how many others? I think it's, it's natural for us to want to get over the suffering as soon as absolutely we can, as fast as possible. Even take this sickness away, Lord. Maybe we should be asking, what can I learn from this? This isn't fun, God, but I'm sure you can use it for good in my life. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times when we take action, even fight back. It's okay to pray for deliverance and healing from sickness. So look at chapter 3 once more. 17, look at verse 17 through 19. As we just said, Habakkuk's facing imminent devastation, right? Pain caused by evil Babylon. Instead of asking for deliverance or even death, some might ask for that, look at his response. Verse 17, he says that basically though there's a complete failure of crops, a total loss of livestock, he's talking about ruin, absolute famine and poverty that they did face when Babylon swooped down only a few years later. But Habakkuk was prepared to trust. Verse 18, Yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. And then 19, The Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. And I think in that, those two verses, we can see Habakkuk's simple formula. Now, <clears throat> I'm taking, don't, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but you can, you can take it for what you will. But I think there's three steps here. Habakkuk is determined, first of all, to trust God. And secondly, he's determined to endure whatever it is. He didn't know exactly in God's strength. You know, he may be, it, there, those verses, he may be dying of hunger. And yet he'll trust God to give him strength. He says he'll find joy in the God who is his only salvation. That's where true happiness is. He can't come through anything else. And I think he's determined not just to survive, but to let God change him. That's an act of humility. He's got an eye toward growth. Something beyond just getting through. I think that picture of the deer walking on the mountain heights speaks of sure-footedness, beauty, of confidence. 
He's determined to trust God, not only to help him through, but to help him grow through this trial, to be sure-footed, to see wisdom. There's value in the trial. I think we should notice, too, that his determination is a choice. It wasn't an emotional state. He says, I will. While Jeffrey Bull was in prison, a woman washing prison laundry found a shirt with his name on it. She made some inquiries and found out that he was alive. Nobody really knew. So at that point, many Christians began to pray throughout the world for him. Later, he says that it was through the loving grace of the Lord Jesus and the prayers of countless people that is why he was sustained during those three plus years. Jeffrey was eventually freed on December 19, 1953. After this, he shared his experiences of sustaining grace while in prison. He married in 1955, and he and his wife served as missionaries for years in what is now Sabah, a state of Malaysia. Jeffrey was involved in Bible conference and teaching. He authored a number of books, one, is which, one which is called God Holds the Key. The focus on the, in the book is on the fact that we are prisoners of Christ, not of China, not of Rome, whatever it might be, but it's the Lord who holds the key in our circumstances. Jeffrey went home to be with the Lord in 1999. So if it's Jeffrey or Habakkuk or you or me, every one of us have or will face pain from less than loving sources. Faith doesn't always understand God's means. That is the pain, the source. But it trusts God's motives. There's always a purpose in pain, even pain from a less than loving source. Remember that quote last week I, I gave you from C.S. Lewis, pain removes the veil and plants the flag of truth within the fortress of a rebel soul. God will use pain for our good. Determine to trust God. Determine to endure in his strength. Determine to let God change you. I'm going to read a quote from Tim Keller. Maybe you've heard of him. He's recently gone on to be with the Lord, but a fairly famous pastor and author from New York. He says, Believers understand many doctrinal truths in the mind, but those truths seldom make the journey down into the heart except through disappointment, failure, and loss. Looking back on our lives, Kathy and I, Kathy's his wife, came to, to realize that all, or that at the heart of why people disbelieve and believe in God, of why people realize, or excuse me, of why people decline and grow in character, of how God becomes less real and more real to us, is suffering. And when we look to the Bible to understand this deep pattern, we came to see that the great theme of the Bible itself is how God brings fullness of joy, not just despite, but through suffering. Just as Jesus saved us, not in spite of, but because of what he endured on the cross. And so there's a peculiar, rich, and poignant joy that comes, that seems to come to us only through and in suffering. He's written a book. <clears throat> I haven't read it, but I, I think it would be a great read if you have an interest. In, you can see it there. Walking with God through pain and suffering. Jesus said, John 16, you will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. We hold on to that. Courage might look a little bit like this. Determined to trust God. Determined to endure in His strength. And determined to let God change you and grow you. There's a song that's called Blessings by Laura Story. I don't know if you've heard that, but 
I'm not going to read it to you, but you can look it up later and listen to it. There's a lot, of, a lot of good there as she thinks about some of her trials and then wrote a song about that, the blessings that come through the hardship. Let's pray together, and I want to remind you that you can, if there's a prayer need, please come up after, and a few elders will be here to pray with you. Father, thank you for Habakkuk, for his message, and I just am thankful for his, his courage to have a discussion with you and to ask tough questions, and I'm also thankful for his faith, his commitment to you, even in his struggle. Thank you for his submission to you. I want to be like that. I want to see, I want to be your servant and, and yet be willing to walk through things with you. And, and thank you for each one of us here that you want to hear from us. You want to hear the questions, not in defiance, but in relationship. Thank you, God, that we can trust you. We can trust your motives, even if we don't really get the means. We don't really see why this pain from lust and loving sources. But we can trust that you're there with us. And not even there with us to get us through, but you're there with us to help us, to help us learn something. I pray, God, for my friends, for me, that we would indeed have that kind of courage, that we would make that determination even as I think Habakkuk did, as he faced real pain. Let's pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand with us and pray this song together with us.